Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, episode three. Okay, so for all you listening, I just took a sip of coffee because I have a big coffee. I'm a filmmaker, right? So when I started this, I thought, let me film them. And I'll put them up on YouTube and you can see them if you want or if you just want to listen, you can just listen. Then I thought, oh, I don't want to be bothered to film it. I'll just, I'll just uh, video, I'll just audio tape it, whatever. But then I showed it to this friend of ours who we met because um, she started taking care of our kids when they were little. And, and she's a friend and also takes care of our kids sometimes. And she listened and she said, oh, I love it, but it's like, you need to videotape it because your whole, you know, your whole, your your funny face and your hair, and like that, that will tie it all together. It ties it all together. I'm like, what do you talk, what, what, what do you mean my funny face and my hair? Like, I don't know, I, I'm, a, I'm a dad now. I have a wonderful, happy marriage. I, could, I, I'm not a ever. I'm not a sexual creature anymore. Listen, it's a little disconcerting. You know, people on a daily or weekly basis used to compliment my blue eyes and stuff. I haven't got a compliment on my eyes in I don't know ten years. Maybe they. I like to say, well, they feel the energy that I'm I'm taking. I don't know. I, I just think they don't look at me as a. They look, they look at me as a. I don't care. My hair. I, my hair just goes like this. I don't know. What am I gonna do? It, it goes like this, and I. Oh, okay. So I'm gonna. Oh, I brushed it. Oh, now it doesn't look weird. I don't, well, I don't care. I don't care. Also, I, now that you see, these are my normal nice glasses, but here's the deal. I can't see anything with those glasses because I can't see close. So what I got was these glasses so I can see close up. Again, because I don't care about how I look, I just wanted the largest frame coverage that I could get, right? The biggest frame area lens area so I could see the most things. Now, unfortunately, the only thing Warby Parker had, the biggest frame, were these ones that are literally the ones that Son of Sam wore. Okay, I go, I was like, oh, Charles Nelson Riley, Google it, kids, for all you people who don't know any of the people I'm talking about. Charles Nelson Riley was this comedian that used to be on this game show, um, Hollywood Squares. Son of Sam was a awful serial killer um, in New York City. Anyway, I Googled it, literally, Son of Sam. So, But someone said, oh no, they're cool retro. I'm like, okay, I'll take that, but whatever. So here's what I wanna talk about. I, I was uh, I was on the way to school, bringing Emmy to school the other day, and um, playing her Beatles, you know, trying to, trying to play her music that I grew up with and that I still love, you know. Um, listen, while I love listening to Let It Go, from Frozen every second of my life because not only is Emmeline, my four and a half year old, obsessed with it, of course now Story, her little sister, who's two, is obsessed with it. Elsa backpack, Elsa quilts, Elsa toothbrush. Elsa, I mean, I get it now. I get it why, like, you know, when you don't have a kid, you're like, you see all this kid merchandise and stuff, you're like, what, what, what? When you have kids, you're like, oh my God, am I an idiot? That's how you make a billion dollars. You do make anything kids want. Anything kids want. So, I luckily that's a good song, that Frozen song, and that Zena Mandel or whatever her name is is like is uh, amazing. I'm not. I don't want to say I'm a closet um, Broadway lover because I, I'm not in the closet about anything. Um, in another life, I don't know. Rock star or quite honestly, Broadway star would be a toss up. Like rock star, of course, incredible. But um, that energy you would feel from a million people up on stage, it's always just looked like, how can you beat that? But 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 a musical Broadway star is pretty cool too. So luckily she's great and that song, Let It Go, I don't think I'm allowed to sing any of it because, although I'm such a bad singer, that's not true, I'm actually a decent singer, but let it go, let it go. I used to be a better singer, but I think I'll get sued for copyright. Can you sing five words of it or something? Let it go. That something. Anyway, Google, it's a great song, but you hear any great song uh, 300 to 400 times a day um, for the last six months. Uh, so I, I play them Beatles, I play them Stevie Wonder, which I'll start crying about because my father used to blast the talking book uh, and sing it. He had a great voice. He was a Broadway musical guy, duh. Uh, 
he would boom out to Stevie Wonder with his great voice and play these big, huge speakers we had. Because in the old days, kids, uh, you had huge speakers. You didn't have little, tiny, weird sonic things that were still as loud, you know. Um, he died March 14th, uh, will be five years ago, of a very sudden stroke. And then they gave him medicine uh, to try to help his stroke right away, called TPA. And that gave him a brain bleed and killed him in within 48 hours. Um, brutal, uh, the most brutal thing, as you can imagine, that I've ever gone through, and I can start weeping any second that I think about it. Um, anyway, so it's hard for me to play Stevie Wonder right now. Uh, still after five years, I, I can't have a picture of him around or anything. You know, it's it's just too hard. But Beatles, I, classic rock, Led Zeppelin, The Stones, uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, all that 70s music, 60s I grew up on. And then R&B, right? All that Bill Withers, you know, Al Green, uh, all that stuff I grew up on. I mean, I don't think you can beat the 70s for music, really. Because uh, you had this mishmash of, like, the greatest rock and roll, the Beatles, uh, the greatest R&B. Uh, it, it was just the, the greatest of all different genres of music was, this, was the 70s. I try to play Amy that stuff. She loves... Uh, Carol King, Tapestry. She loves when I feel the earth move. She, and she likes the Beatles. We used to sing uh, the two of us from Let It Be. That'll definitely make me start crying. Um, and I'm not going to try to sing that. But uh, again, Google Google all these references, people who don't know what I'm talking about. Because they're important for you to know. You know, I love all the youth of the world and technology. But the, but the whole thing of not knowing anything that came before Frozen, like, is a problem. You know, people are like, what, I was born? Like, I'm only 20. I'm like, you know, who, you've heard of George Washington, right? So you know of people, you know of historical events that happened before you. Just have to know about more of them. Um, trust me, I'm far from like Mr. Historian, dude. But like, just the normal average person uh, who's above 40, right? If you're above 40, you grew up without all the technology. So who's above 40, you just knew, you know stuff. And, and people under 40 and 30 and stuff... You just got to know more stuff. It's just important to know stuff that came before us. Uh, it, it just, it's, it's, um, I don't know why it's important, but it's just important for character. So I'm playing two of us for Emmy in the car on the way to school and uh, trying to fight back tears. And I have this running joke with her that I say, listen, because she looks so big, so fast all the time, right? She's constantly looking older to me. I'll go away for two days to a poker tournament like I just came back from, and she suddenly looks like she's 15, you know. Um, and everyone told me and tells you when you have kids, it's going to go so fast. Like, blink of an eye. Like, I told one of the poker dealers about Frozen all day long. He's like, enjoy it, man. Enjoy it. That those that times go so fast. I have another friend, Joe, who when I, Sarah gave me this shirt, this weird shirt that has like a, a papoose, like a kangaroo pouch in the front of it. So you... You pull out the pouch and the little infant can just be in there next to you. And my friend Joe was like, listen, you, that's only going to be for like two seconds that you're allowed to put her in there because she's going to grow so fast. Enjoy it. So everyone tells you that. Enjoy it, enjoy it, enjoy it. It's going to go fast. But then again, it really does. You know, so Emmy's like almost five. And I look back at, at pictures and videos and stuff that I'm in with her that are only from a year ago even, two years ago, and I have no independent recollection of those events that I'm in from a year ago. So like I see that it happened because there's a video of it and I'm talking about some, oh, it's a funny Australian Elsa doll that your aunt gave you. Independently, I have, I have no memory of that happening. That's a problem, right? Like I, I wonder, am I, am I, do I have a brain tumors or something? And I don't know. I have independent recollections of other things that happened a year ago, uh, you know. Um, so that scares me. I don't know why that is, but well, I have some ideas why that is. But so that's also why it goes so fast, because if I don't even remember anything that's happening except today. So I have this running gag with my daughter where I'll say, don't, why are you growing so fast? Stop growing. There's something wrong with you. I, we got to take you to the doctor. You're not supposed to grow this fast. She's like, no, daddy, that's what my, just what my body does. It so I was in the car the other morning and she started laughing. We did the gag. I said, you're growing too fast. Can you please just do me a favor and stop growing so fast? And I, I suddenly got hit with this wave of emotion about it, about the reality that that's true. 
that she's getting so big so fast. See, I'll start crying right now. I'm just very weepy about, I've always been a big uh, emotional person. So I started getting teary when that hit me, the reality of, the, of what was a gag of that she's getting big so fast. And I thought about it and I thought I'd always, I thought I'd be the greatest dad in the world. Oh my God, I'm so fun, I'm so funny, I'm so loving, I'm gonna love them and play with them. And I do that, I do love them to death, but as I've, as I've always said when I was trying to meet a woman, love is the easy part. Loving someone is, is easy. That's not the make or break for a relationship with a, a partner, an adult, or and certainly not for a child. Right, it's like, do you want the same things? You grow in the same way with with a, a partner. All those things, you want to live in the same place. Like it sounds dumb, but anyone who's been through this knows that that's the stuff that establishes whether you can have a long term relationship. Not that you love them. I've loved, I loved to death every woman I was with, uh, all my girlfriends, uh, and for all those logistical reasons, it didn't work out. One wanted to have kids sooner than I did. Um, I didn't want to have kids in my thirties. One w turned out to be a drunk, you know, and I that was deal breaker like and with kids I love listen I love my kids more than life itself uh and I'm sure my parents love me tons and my dad did too but patience tolerance spending time kindness all those things uh I think I'm finding as a father as a parent are more important to my daughters than me loving them. They feel, listen, baseline, you gotta love them to death. They, they'll, obviously they'll feel that. But I don't spend as much time with my daughters as I, as I want to want to. And I feel uh, like I suck as a parent because of that. I get it, listen, to my defense, when they're little, you know, I had a, a step, I have a stepmom who was like, oh God, taking care of a, Six month old, how unbelievably boring. And I'm like, are you allowed to say that really? Like, but, I mean, so true, right? I mean, love her to love my daughters to death, but when they're just it, all day long, you know, cause see, I don't work out of the house, right? I work in the house, unless I'm shooting a film, which is like three weeks every two or three years, I'll, I'll go and shoot a film. Then I'm outside of the house 20 hours, the whole time I'm gone. But when I'm writing, when I'm editing, when I'm producing, all that stuff is done in the house. I don't, I, and mainly. And I set it up that way. I wanted to be home with my kids a lot of the time, most of the time. Historically, obviously it's changed a lot now, but um, still a lot of fathers are out working nine to five. They come home, they're, they get a little bit in the morning maybe, they come home, they're the conquering hero. Hi daddy, love you, love you. And it's like bedtime and then so a lot of dads that work nine to five, 40 hours a week, 60 hours a week, they might not identify with this part of it, how hard it is. They're not around for like a lot of, a lot of the stress. They come home. It's much easier for the kids to just be so excited to see them. Like when I come home from a poker trip, my daughter is like, she wrote me seven, I love you cards this morning. Identical, seven identical, I love you cards. I love you so much. I love you. 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 Oh my God, daddy. Hugs, kisses. Listen. That's going to last for five hours. I'm going to come home today and I'm going to say, no, the TV's got to go off and she's going to start screaming. But if you work out of the house, right, that's, that paradigm is set up almost on a daily basis because they're, you're gone those eight hours, and they come home. And so not that there's no trouble, but a lot less trouble. Uh, that's not my life. My life is with them a lot of the time, which, which again, I like, but it has its challenges. So, I thought, so it's hard for me to be the just fun guy, fun loving guy all the time, um, but I'm working on it. I wanna change. I, I wanna, I don't need to sit and watch an hour of news from five to six while they're playing. I can play with them. I, the news, there's nothing on the news that I need to know that's gonna change my life for the better. I always used to say that, right? There's nothing I'm learning about once in a while what I got to learn that there's a flood coming. I got to get out of the house. I mean, once in a while in Vermont that happens, but short of that, and I'm sure that someone at the store will tell me hey, there's a flood coming. You got to get out of your house. But short of that, all the junk I watch, any politics and stuff, it just makes me angry. 
or it scares me or freaks me out no matter what side, left, right, it's all the same thing. They just, I'm gonna try not to do that. I'm gonna try to spend more time. I wanna know my daughters more. My wife knows them better than I do. Uh, and I, I mean, I know what my daughter's favorite colors are. I know they love Elsa, I know, but I feel like their lives are are slipping away. I'm, I'm missing their lives. And I'm home all the time. I, I don't even have the excuse and I'm, I work six hours a week out of the house. I don't want to miss their lives. I don't want to miss their lives because I can see how fast it's going. So here's one of the things that I think I realized, which I'm sure everyone's talked about, but I don't hear it talked about that much, is that, okay, so I've always had a, a tough time being present. I think most people do, right? People give up all worldly possessions and go to a mountaintop in Tibet uh, with nothing to learn how to be present, right? And it's hard for them. Right? They don't have to worry about mortgages or car payments or anything. Listen, as a man in America, I was taught the barometer for success is to get stuff. There's like a multi-trillion dollar advertising behemoth that's pounding into my brain to brainwash me. This happened since I've been born, but it's even more so now in the last 10 years with the advent of technology, right? I mean, it... You are, it is hard to fight against the, the programming machine of buy more, get more, consume more, eat more, uh, especially if you're a man. Listen, of course, there are a lot of things that men and women are very similar on in the Venn diagram, they overlap, but then there's a lot of stuff that men and women biologically, mentally, emotionally, we just think differently. It's just a fact. I, I'm not going to get into it. Um, so women out there, of course, you identify with me on, on a ton of stuff. And a ton of stuff you might not, or you identify with the feelings, but but you present your life differently. What you think about and focus on is different. Listen, if there's silence in the car for a minute, for five minutes, and then suddenly I say to my wife, like, we'll talk at the same time, right, with the, what we've been thinking about. She'll say, oh my God, did you remember to pack Emmy's pretzels today with her lunch and it's our snack day tomorrow? And I'll say, so listen, I'm thinking about playing a poker tournament in three weeks. Would that be okay with you? She's got the kids on her mind 24-7. As a man in America, I'm, so I'm born as a male animal, so I want to provide, I want to get stuff. You can't fight against that DNA. It's just how I'm built. Or I'm not good. So the barometer of success as a, as a man is all out of whack. I mean, yes, you want to provide. That's great. But, but in our culture today, in America, um, if I don't get everything, material things, then... I'm a failure. It's not, was I kind today? How much did I help today? Did I uh, pay really good attention and play with my daughters today? Right? We're not taught that to be the barometer of success as a man in this culture. So I got to fight against that. I don't want to live off the grid in the woods. So it, I said, how do I live in this culture but fight against that? So I have a hard time being present. I think a lot of people do. That was it there in existence before I ever had kids. So just being present, because I don't want to go live on a mountaintop and practice presence. I do, I meditate, I do yoga, I practice being present, but I'm terrible at it. But I keep trying. So it's hard for me to be present anyway. So then I realized this thing, that I'm so terrified of the kids crying and being upset and throwing tantrums and at different stages of their life it, it always happens right I mean they're great kids of course that's a given but I'm so terrified especially at the end of the night when I'm exhausted right I'm, well I'm exhausted all the time so I'm so terrified of them being unhappy throwing fits crying not going to bed not doing what I'm asking them to do that I'm kind of not present because I'm just, while I'm reading the book at night, I thought reading the book at night was going to be this most beatific, incredible experience every night, this picture of just loving them and we're reading and she's so happy and I'm reading and really into the book and doing the voices and, and she's just loving me and then we kiss goodnight and then she goes to bed. That's not how reading is. Reading at the end of the night for me is I'm not even 
aware when I'm reading this book because I'm just thinking, oh my God, get through this quickly. Hopefully tonight she's not going to say I didn't read enough. She's not going to ask for five things. She wants five things on her plate every night that she doesn't even eat. Maybe uh, Hopefully she's going to go to bed. That's what I'm thinking while I'm reading. Talk about not being present. So then, and I wonder why, you know, I don't have this experience of that I thought reading her a good night book was going to be. And then I feel terrible. I'm like, I suck. And why don't I just... So that's why I think a big reason why I'm missing her life, missing their lives, not remembering what I did with them last year when there's video evidence of it. Fun stuff, like fun playing in the snow, whatever. Because I'm constantly so anxious and terrified uh, that I want to do damage control uh, if they cry. So to that end, I had a, I drove a cab in New York for like eight years in my 20s after college when I was writing screenplays, trying to get my movie career off the, off the ground. I was a lifelong New Yorker. I grew up there. The year I started driving a cab, everyone's like, oh, cab is, cabbies from New York are all foreign. They don't know any where they're going. Like, they should have to go to some kind of school. In London, they have a thing called the Knowledge, which all cab drivers, it's a two-year school, intensive school. All cab drivers in London have to go through uh, to, be, to be cab drivers. New York, they had nothing like that. As you know, if you took a cab uh, before 1984. But in 1984, the first year I started driving a cab, they decided they were going to make all prospective cabbies go to cabbie school. So I was like, seriously? Like, I, I, I don't need to go to cabbie school. 20 hours. You could do three eight-day. I'm like, let me just get it over with. Three eight-day, hour, eight-hour days in Queens, like at LaGuardia Community College. I, I'm not kidding. This is not... not I'm not being hyperbolic. The test questions on the final exam were Penn Station is A in Queens, B in the Bronx, C in Brooklyn, D, 32nd Street and 7th Avenue. I'm like, look, are you kidding me? Let me take the test. I'll pay. It's, if it's money, you, it's a revenue thing. You have the 500 bucks. I'll, let me just, I'll pay the 500 bucks. Let me take the test now. And if I pass it, I don't have to go to cabbie school. They're like, no, 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 you got to go to cabbie school. So I'm in cabbie school. And this teacher said this amazingly profound Zen thing. He's like up there. And it, I didn't expect him to say it. He was like, not the kind of guy that I thought was going to deliver this message, especially in cabbie school. He's like, learn to love traffic. I'm like... Okay, he's like, because you're going to be in it a lot, especially if you drive the day shift in New York City. So you're in New York City. You have all this stuff at your fingertips. If you're in stuck in traffic, you can look at all the interesting people on the street, look at the beautiful architecture. Learn to love traffic. So that's like very Buddhist, right? Maybe he was a Buddhist because first from, I know very little about this stuff, but what I understand is the first tenet in Buddhism is life is difficult. And by understanding that, it's, it's not so difficult because you expect it to be difficult. In our culture, right, the whole idea is, is uh, things are supposed to be easy. Um, and so then instantly when things are not easy, uh, I get all angry and upset and freaked out. Or I, I'm trying not to be. Instead of starting out with, it's going to be difficult today. And then I expect it. Sometimes I even think through my day. And I think through what's going to trip me up today. It could be anything. It could be like dumb things for me. Like I'm going to put my yoga mat down and yoga and somebody's going to put their mat too close and it's going to annoy me. Right. Great. Oh, I'm in this like spiritual place to go try to get a spiritual experience and I'm already getting resentments for no good reason. But that's me. So I think about that and I think, oh, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to move my yoga mat over. I'm going to be generous with space. It's like not my space. It's like we're going to... And by thinking about how I'm going to handle it, what's going to annoy me and how I'm going to handle it best, better than getting a resentment, uh, I set myself up uh, to have that experience. And then when someone does it, I'm already programmed, reprogrammed to um, be generous instead of 
be clutching for everything, money, material, space, right? Which I'm programmed to to want to act like. So, learn to love traffic. I realize, learn to love screaming and crying. Lean into screaming and crying. In the morning, go, you know what? There's going to be a lot of screaming and crying today. That's what happens with two-year-olds and four-year-olds. There's going to be a lot of stubbornness, uh, butting of heads. That's what uh, the psyche of a two-year-old and a four-year-old is supposed to be. They're supposed to be doing that. How am I going to handle the best? Am I going to get super angry right away, rageful, and send them to their room? Or am I going to try to handle it in a more loving, gentle, considerate, caring way? That's what I'm, that's what I, that's what I remember. And from 1984 is learn to love traffic, learn to love screaming and crying and have a chance, have a chance today of, uh, changing so that I don't miss my kid's childhood. And I'm not sitting there dropping them off at college, uh, fighting back tears and then sitting in the car weeping because they're gone and I missed it all.